on. Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to tonight's session for November 21st, 2022. Um, first off is uh, we interviewed legis legislative lobbyists um, in the last few weeks, and uh, we have a recommendation tonight to continue with Amy Atwood. Um, she knows us, she understands Westminster, she works well with all of our lobbyists or her lobbyists, all of our um, senators and legislators. Um, she works with CML and really talked about when we have a different opinion, then CML has to go with a statewide approach. And sometimes that's not going to be the same as the city of our size. So um, she shares with them and, and talks. She had some great suggestions for us. Um, she knows that we could do better with our communication between her and us and um, her biggest thing was we really have to figure out a way to react quickly because sometimes when they're in the midst of these things, especially towards the end of the um, <clears throat> sessions, things go quick. So when she sends out something and we get it within two or three hours, she needs an answer one way or the other or we become mute on the situation. So um, with that, um, do you have anything else you would like to add? Mm -hmm. um, the only thing I would add is, well, to reiterate that I think it's important that she has a relationship with our current delegation that that uh, is at the state house making law. So I think that that was probably the biggest thing for me. And then she had some really good recommendations that we talked about through it. I and mean, then we talked with staff about bringing them in sooner rather than later so that we are figuring out how we can partner with our delegation and support them on things that are important to us in our strategic plan. I thought that was a really good um, idea. Um, but otherwise, um, I think that uh, Amy outshined the other group and she has experience with us and that's been showed in the, in the process. And I know Chris Lindsay's with us and you um, work with our lobbyists. So, so uh, appreciate the the opportunity to speak tonight. Um, so we we uh, we received three compliant proposals. Uh, we interviewed uh, two of those uh, vendors. Um, those were the two lower bids that we received. Um, we had really good uh, interviews, I think, with both of those, with the mayor and the mayor pro tem and a staff uh, team. Um, I think the the item that's important. Um, that's a difference is that um, Atwood Public Affairs proposed um, without uh, a subcontractor, which is different than their current structure. Um, and um, that the municipal experience, especially, we were all comfortable um, moving forward with uh, with Atwood Public Affairs. That, that was a question I was going to want to address is, is without moving forward with the subcontractor, did she feel confident that she'd still have that breadth that we need? Okay. And she has a relationship, so that's really a big part of it, but yes, that's a, a little greater coverage. So, okay. Does everybody feel comfortable giving staff direction to go ahead and get a contract ready? Okay, like you guys like them, it's fine by me. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is that well? Okay. We can do that. Thanks. Thank you. Um, next, I had a phone call about three o'clock this afternoon, and I'm just going to share quickly what it's about. And if any staff wants a phone number to call and talk to this person more, I am happy to. I don't want to give it verbally because it's their personal phone call, but. Um, it's called GoPuff, and they are located on in, on 74th Avenue in um, Historic Westminster. They've been there since 2009. It's a warehouse, but they do on-demand grocery convenience um, sales. They have a website. They have an app. Um, anybody within a certain radius, because they pride themselves on once they get the order, it will be delivered within 30 to 45 minutes. And... Um, they have fresh vegetables, they have anything a grocery store has, um, plus some um, things like a Walgreens might have with um, certain drugs and whatnot. They're open from 7 a.m. to 2.30 a.m. 
uh, you have a choice of either buying a monthly um, membership for $8 and then for that month you get as many deliveries for free. If you don't want to do that because maybe you would only have one delivery, the charge is $4 uh, time that they come to deliver to your door. So if anybody on staff would like that information, happy to share. Other, we need a motion to excuse Sarah Nirmala from this meeting. Second. It's been moved and seconded to excuse Sarah um, Nirmala from the meeting. Um, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Thanks. Other council reports? Mm -hmm. Because of the weather last week, um, the North Metro Arts Alliance um, was canceled and their next meeting it they moved it to December 3rd or excuse me December 1st but I have a uh, another commitment so I'm wondering if anyone could fill in for me what time is it um for I think it was four o'clock for me excuse me they moved it to on the first on the first at um the art gallery yeah um can you forward that to me Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for filling in. I can get shopping done then too. <laughs> Mayor Putin. Um, I went down to the Irving Street Library um, event on my Parks and Rec. It was a, a good event, so good good job to staff. Um, when I was there, it was pretty good turnout considering how cold it was. I was out and left pretty early, mm -hmm. um, but it was well done and it seemed to be well received from the community. So I just wanted to share that because I wasn't sure since I ditched out early being a wuss. I wasn't sure if the rest of you were able to make it down there or not, but it was a good event. Councilor Baker, anything? Councilor Yassadi? Yeah, so the uh, Westminster Legacy Foundation sent a request. Um, they would like me to join the board. I didn't know there was, that there was another. So you saw the emails. I'm just asking if um, anyone has an objection I would like to accept. I have no objection. Thank you. That's all. Okay, city managers. All right, thank you. We'll go ahead and pull up the slide. So go to the next slide. Uh, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, counselors, ladies and gentlemen, members of the community. So uh, some things to update folks on. Um, we had a, a, a member of the community during our November 14th meeting during public comment um, asked a couple questions. And so I just wanted to follow up publicly um, to, in answer to those. Um, and so first of all, there was a question about uh, a water portal on our city website where you know individuals could um, view their water usage, pay utility bills, sign up for any kind of leak notice and access water efficiency programs. Uh, we have had some scheduling challenges, both um, from the city side and from the digital payment provider side. So it has been delayed, um, but um, we believe that those have all been worked through at this point, and we will expect to turn that on here in first quarter of 2023. So. Um, Long answer is, is that it will get done, but it's going to be a couple more months for that to be finished. So, um, and I see the gentleman is in attendance tonight. So I'm glad we're able to, to get an answer on that. Um, and I think that's a great project for the city to have for its residents. And I'm excited about it, uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, I just wanted to, I appreciate you bringing this forward and answering the question. Um, I did some thinking about this, but if I recall, and I think it's important for the public to know that this was pushed so that we could accommodate staff's time being needed to change our water rates in the summer. Is that, am I remembering that right? I think that's a just important um, caveat for the public to understand that staff was planning for my re recollection to get this done by summer last year, but it was pushed because of the water rate change. Okay, yeah. Yeah. okay. fair enough. Um, so good news there on the water portal. Uh, next thing uh, was uh, some encroach, oh, excuse me. Question? Sure. Will it have historical, um, any historical data when it's turned on or will it be just from when it's on? Let me ask, DPW Director Sarah Borgers. 
Let me check it to answer your question. That is a fantastic. I'm not sure what's going to happen when it rolls over. So let me get back to you on it later on that. Thanks. Yeah, good question. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know whether it's historical for, you know, the past, um, what, you know, something multiple like decades or something or months, or is it this time forward? I don't know. Good question. Um, so the next question was uh, about Sunset Park encroachment. Um, we had some residents that had encroached uh, into city property at Sunset Park. Um, there were wood piles out there. Um, there was some concrete slabs that had actually been poured on the city-owned property. And so uh, city staff worked with uh, residents um, to voluntarily comply uh, to remove all that privately owned property and infrastructure from the city property. Uh, and, uh, you know, city staff worked with a contractor to remove any remaining items that were encroaching upon the park. I did see pictures um, that uh, showed kind of the before and after, and uh, it was a remarkable uh, cleanup effort. And so uh, thank you to the uh, gentleman for bringing that to our attention. And so um, we've, uh, we've cleaned up uh, that encroachment. And so uh, there will be a, a fence that's installed to protect the park. Um, ensure no future encroachments, um, but uh, um, I think that's a, a great step. And so uh, to the gentleman, uh, thanks for bringing that to our attention. Next slide. Uh, and then last uh, was a question about channel eight. That's the city's public information channel. Um, and, uh, you know, we're in the process of working to upgrade our audio visual system and restore city programming to that public uh, channel. Um, there were some uh, discussions, I guess, prior to my arrival back in May um, regarding the project requirements. Um, we do have a local AV company that the city uh, has contracted with to um, put the project together. Um, and I guess it also has to do with some uh, infrastructure improvements here uh, in this room. Um, it has been delayed as so many things are today because of supply chain issues. Um, we uh, you know, have replaced some end of life radio frequency transport equipment with new fiber, which is a significant step. Um, and so a lot of other technology improvements, um, but, uh, you know, hoping to relaunch this by the end of second quarter um, uh, in 2023. Um, we would like to see that earlier, certainly, but I don't want to um, over promise and under deliver. I'd rather under promise and over deliver. So at the latest second quarter, but um, hopefully we can do it uh, sooner. And again, that's all dependent upon um, our uh, uh, supply chain issues. And so I think we're, to the gentleman, I think we're in a good uh, position there. And so thank you again uh, to members of the public when they bring issues or questions to us. We want to get you the information. We want to be transparent. We want to be responsive. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll use this forum to kind of follow up on those when they come in this, uh, in our council meetings. Um, also for the community police chief recruitment, I know that's a big deal. Um, we, uh, this past week, we had the recruiter um, on site here talking with the police department members um, and conducting uh, uh, interviews with them as far as what they think uh, are the, uh, the qualities of that future police chief. Um, and uh, so that was good. We've also rolled out here uh, this week, um, well, actually last week, a survey for the community, anybody to um, respond to. I forwarded it to the council. I hope that uh, you're able to participate, but the link is there. Um, and uh, what that will allow us to do uh, is put together the recruiting profile, um, which will uh, go out on the street here in the month of December. Um, and, uh, uh, and then after the new year, uh, we'll start our uh, interviews and vetting process of those candidates. Again, my goal is to have somebody um, at the latest in that seat by uh, the 1st of May, okay? And so positive movement there. Council? Just wanted to say publicly, it was a really good survey. Okay. When I took it, it was short, it's straight to the point and well-written with no glitches, so. Okay, yeah, thank good. you, Councilor, and to Deputy City Manager um, Barbara Opie um, and the Police Chief and others, you know, they did a nice job of putting that together. So thank Very you again. Smooth. Thank you. Next slide. Um, so uh, we've had some questions about uh, um, what happens to our folks that are homeless in our community um, when the weather starts to go south um, and uh, um, you know just not be so favorable. The city does work. Our city navigators work specifically with 
Adams County uh, for what they call the Severe Weather Activation Plan or SWAP, um, which in which you know somebody can get a hotel voucher for families, single adults that may be living outdoors. And that SWAP program is um, initiated when the temperature falls to 32 degrees and wet or 22, 20 degrees and dry. Um, and so they'll send notifications out to the community um, so folks can register to get those vouchers. Um, they also do provide our Westminster navigators with, uh, with hotel vouchers for distribution. And so we certainly don't wanna see folks uh, out in those elements. And there are programs like this um, to accommodate. Um, we work similarly um, with Jefferson County, but it's a different kind of program. And so a little bit different, but this was uh, just from an Adams County perspective. But uh, I think the staggering number there is, is since November 3rd, um, Adams County has distributed 293 vouchers already and we're not even th what, three weeks in. So um, that's a tough number. And that's <clears throat> Adams County wide, not necessarily Adams County Westminster. Correct, right. Adams County wide. Right. Thank you. Yep. So uh, that's, uh, that's kind of an update for everybody there. Next slide. Uh, shared an underpass project. Um, you all are intimately familiar with it. I'm just learning, but uh, um, some critical uh, steps have been taken, milestones this past month. So the underpass concrete foundations have been completed. Um, they are currently planning uh, public outreach uh, beginning November 22nd, tomorrow. Um, and, uh, and they've received the $2.8 million in federal and state reimbursements uh, to the project uh, to date. Um, staff does plan to complete um, some act the following activities in the next coming weeks. So installation of final 75 feet of concrete arch underpass sections, that'll happen on November 29th. Um, certainly attentive to not wanting to uh, cause major delays on Sheridan Boulevard. Um, and then uh, we've got construction of concrete retaining walls uh, that will be adjacent to the underpass on the east side of Sheridan Boulevard. So. Um, progress, uh, but just wanted to make sure everybody had that update. Uh, again, expected to be completed in the spring of 2023. Next slide. Um, and then some Westy winds. So good news story, as Mayor Pro Tem uh, commented, commented, the Irving Street Library Community Barbecue, um, it drew a diverse mix of about 200 community members. So very, very nicely attended. Um, and the intent of the city was to connect the neighborhood um, with uh, this uh, Irving Street Playground um, project after it was destroyed by arson this past July. Um, folks, uh, even though it was cold outside, they did enjoy hot dogs and mariachi music um, and then provided feedback to the community, which I think is so important. We're always looking for community input on what this should look like or what it should be like. Um, and so the Friends of Westminster Library distributed boxes of free books. Um, and we had some local businesses and branches that passed out coupons and samples to event goers. And so a, a nice win for the community. Um, next was the market night food basket giveaway. Um, so in partnership with the Senior Hub, uh, a North Glen based nonprofit that focuses on older adults in Adams and Arapahoe counties uh, since 1986, that's the Senior Hub. Um, and uh, city staff handed out 600 boxes of fresh vegetables and toiletries, cleaning supplies at the map uh, and that uh, again, known as market night, um, but that was the, fitty, the city's first um, uh, food and supplies distribution effort to the community since 2020. And so a good sign that we're moving um, out of the pandemic and uh, engaging the community. So another Westy win. win. Next slide. Uh, length of service award. So the city recognized um, folks with uh, five, 10, 15, all the way up to 40 years of service city employees. We had a total of 26 employees across nine departments um, and they represented 415 years of service. And so um, another win for the city. Uh, and then I think another win, something that the, uh, the council certainly been waiting on, the staff has been waiting on, um, and that is the city uh, hired Mr. Armando Martin as the city's first equitable process coordinator. Uh, his first day with the city will be on Monday, December 5th. Um, and this position is responsible for guiding the city and developing a strategy for our diversity, equity, and inclusion journey. 
Um, and uh, I had an opportunity to meet um, Mr. Martin um, and uh, very, very impressed by his experiences, his education um, background um, and his passion um, for this community and, and uh, helping the city to make some uh, inroads into the DEI uh, kind of uh, um, a stack of, uh, of uh, effort. So uh, a good move for the city. Next slide. Uh, and then uh, I think this is my last Westy win, but I uh, had the pleasure of attending the South Adams, Arvada and Westminster Fire Academy graduation on Friday evening. Um, and uh, we uh, essentially welcome uh, four new firefighters um, and their names are listed there. Uh, but uh, what I would tell you is, is what was so special to me was um, watching families, mothers, fathers, grandparents, sons, daughters, um, fiancés, uh, um, making, pinning those uh, badges on the firefighters from across multiple communities, um, nicely attended, standing room only. Um, and uh, the only thing that was challenging about it was finding that place in the dark when you don't know where you're going. So I was just totally dialed into my GPS and making blind turns. So, um, but I got there, I was a little late, but I got there. So, um, but what a great event. Um, and uh, so glad that that uh, um, fire academy is uh, is available to us. Next slide. Some things to know, just uh, it's the holiday week. So Thursday, Friday, uh, city administrative offices are closed. Um, uh, emergency personnel obviously will remain um, on duty and the city will remain uh, functional in those regards. And then our next city council meeting is Monday at 630 uh, right here in council chambers. Next slide. And wrapping up, um, you know, we want to make sure that we're accessible to uh, the community. Please give my office a call at 658-2006. You can email me directly at mfrytag at cityofwestminster.us. And you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, check us out on Instagram, or connect with us on Nextdoor, which um, I've now discovered, um, and that's totally cool. So um, that's my update, pending any questions. Okay. Standing. That brings us to um, information items. Anybody have anything to share about the retail strategy report? That was an eye opener. And my only question was, how are we linking that now with comprehensive land use plan? Because I would think it has going to have some impact on that. Yep. So economic development director, uh, Lindsay Kimball. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor, for your question. Um, we are working very closely with community development. We've actually sat down with them and looked at pretty much parcel by parcel analysis of the city to make sure that we are prepared for the future. Um, <clears throat> so I would say that's definitely, it's important to us to preserve the retail land, especially on important corners and thoroughfares, and to make sure that we are able to sustain, particularly our tax base, so that we have a um, sustainable community in the future. Thanks. Any other questions on this item? How much did it cost? I believe twenty twenty three thousand. Is that correct? Okay. Yes, my staff is telling me yes, twenty three thousand. Okay, and it was quite interesting information. Mm -hmm. And they already talked to you about the over retail part. Any other questions on that one? No. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, the next one is a 48 hour bill and impact on municipal court operations and budget. Any questions? Yes. So, Councillor Baker. Uh, Chris. The judge is here, I see. Yes, the judge is here. Uh, uh, because at a city level, most of our offenses are of very low nature. And because both the jails and Adams and Jeff won't take any prisoners except for personal injury kind of uh, problems, how many do you think we'll see? So, <clears throat> thank you, Council Baker. Jason Lawn, time of presiding municipal court judge. Uh, I anticipate most weekends we'll have court on Saturday. Um, we looked retrospectively and tried to calculate. Uh, what that would uh, mean going forward. So arrests that were happening Thursday after hours on Friday, things of that nature. 
Um, to your comment about what the jails will or will not uh, hold, it is true that the jails will hold individuals um, for quote unquote persons, crimes, assaults, uh, batteries, things like that. The jails will also hold individuals um, for theft, criminal mischief, uh, other criminal code violations. Depending on which jail, uh, there's a, a bond threshold that would need to be in place. So for instance, Adams County will hold someone on, for instance, a theft uh, case if the bond is set at $750. Jefferson County, their policies are slightly different. Their bond threshold is $1,000. Uh, but nonetheless, um, Adams County, for instance, will hold uh, someone on a new charge Maybe if, if they hadn't failed to appear and there was no bond set, uh, Adams County will also hold individuals for non-persons crimes uh, as well. So uh, we expect to see people um, two different ways. One would be if there had been a failure to appear and a bond was set uh, at either a no bond hold or above $750, then the jails would hold those individuals if they were contacted by law enforcement. The other way that we would see individuals if they were arrested on new probable cause, and the way we generally will see those are the domestic violence cases, just because um, it's more likely that uh, when there's new probable cause for an offense, if it's a non-person's crime, the officer will typically write a summons rather than institute an arrest. So um, maybe more words than necessary, but I expect most weekends we'll see someone that is either arrested on a warrant uh, with a bond or the new PC arrests. So you think most of them will be domestic violence, but at the low level we handle, or they'll be failure to appear? Correct. The, the vast majority, I think, will either be new probable cause arrests. So the officers called out to an incident, make an arrest right then, transport the individual to jail. And the other will be uh, typically a failure to appear on a case and the court has issued a bench warrant with a bond amount attached. And if that bond amount is, is over the threshold for the, the particular jail, then the jail will hold them until we have a bond hearing. Okay, and don't we have a bond schedule already in we, place? We do have a standardized bond schedule. Uh, it is, it depends on the individual characteristics of the, the case, but we do have a, a standard bond schedule in place. Uh, so for instance, if there's an arrest warrant on a new domestic violence case, that there's no bond on that until the individual is seen by the court. Uh, most other cases, bond is set at schedule of uh, $750, cash or surety. Okay, and as I read the thing, Practically the only person who has to show up is you, right? Well, well everyone else is virtual. We are we are hopeful that that will uh, work for virtual for everybody, including uh, the judge, whoever is myself or the judge that's on call. We've worked really hard with the individual jails to uh, establish a schedule where they will have their virtual court available to us. Uh, we worked with um, Jefferson County. We're scheduled to have uh, a time slot at 9 a.m. on Saturday mornings with Jefferson County Jail and 10 a.m. Uh, virtual court with, with Adams County Jail. Now, there will be uh, situations where there may be an arrest out of jurisdiction, whether or not, if it's not Adams or Jeffco, there may be those occasions where there need to be physical transports uh, to the jail, in which case more people will need to come in. But over the past several months, we've been working to make sure that we can do as much of this virtually as possible to particularly limit the transport expenses and, and the risks involved with okay. that. And, and so back to my original question, how many do you expect to see each weekend? Two? Well, Councilor, I, I need to look at the numbers a little closer to give you an exact number, right. but I would Because anticipate... we don't, we only do about 30 DV cases a month. That's probably accurate. I think we average somewhere around 300 a year, but I would need to look back on that. So typically on for weekend court, we would expect somewhere between one to, well, I need to look at the numbers, but if I'm just giving a rough, rough estimate, somewhere between one to three to four individuals. Right, so, uh, so it would be 
that would be enough time in the two hours, Jeff at nine and Adams at 10 to, to really take care of it then. Yes, I would, I would suspect so. There's, a, there's work that needs to happen on the front end. For instance, the public defender needs to have an interview with their mm -hmm. client before the hearing and the clerks need to get the paperwork and make the arrangements with the jail uh, at the front end before the hearing happens and there's work on the tail end. But typically just because of primarily how our cases and that ratio is set up, we set Jefferson County earlier in the morning because we tend to see fewer cases uh, from Jefferson County, more from Adams, and that way we should be done with Jefferson County before the Adams County cases start up. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you and have a happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. You all as well. Thank you. That brings us to our presentation, Stanley Lake Security Assessment. All right. And so we'll have uh, Public Works Director Sarah Borgers and uh, her team come forward. Right, we're going to awkwardly squish in at the front of the table. Um, so Tonight we are bringing the Stanley Lake Security Audit, which was has been uh, a joint project between the City of Westminster, the City of Northland, and the City of Thornton. Um, the results of that, I'm going to be a little kind of all over the place here, I apologize, um, resulted in essentially three documents. Uh, one is a document that you'll see in executive session. We'll talk about that. It's got physical security stuff, so it's pretty protected. <laughs> Uh, and then we also have uh, the Stanley Lake Security Assessment itself. This was the bulk of the work that was done between the cities of Westminster, Thornton, and North Glen. And then the other document that was in your packet is this voting report. It looks like this. So this was commissioned solely by the city of Westminster. Uh, Thornton and North Glen are not particularly interested in spending a lot of money and time on this. So this was uh, just the city of Westminster. Um, so with us tonight, we have quite a few people. We have Elizabeth Brown. Elizabeth Brown. <laughs> You're close <enough. laughs> She's with Elizabeth Environmental Consult Consulting and Shawnee Klein, who is uh, with Corona. You should be able to remember that, right? <laughs> Um, and these were the consultants that were involved in the security audit part of this. We will talk about Surveillance One, who was the security experts that in executive session. We'll talk about that then. Also here we have Holly Walters, who is the Stanley Lake Superintendent, and Kelly Klein, who is our Water Quality Administrator, and Ryan Decker, who is our Senior Engineer. Um, and also the project manager on this project. So um, it's been a long, complicated project, um, but we're looking forward. And I forgot your name. I'm Chad so, Seidel. Chad Seidel, uh, who is um, one of the lead people for Corona. So we've got a really strong team here. Please feel free to ask questions. Um, I'm going to step in towards the end to have more kind of policy discussion towards the end, but we're going to provide some informational stuff ahead of time. Um, all right, so just briefly in the agenda, we're going to talk about ownership and management of the lake. Uh, as you all are aware, there is, some, it's complicated who owns what out there, so we're going to go through some overview of that. We're going to go through the uh, gaps and gaps analysis that was completed and the results of that. We'll have a section talking about voting specifically, and then we'll have a policy discussion at the end. All right, I think I covered everything and I'm gonna get out of your way. All right, well, sounds like, thank you, by the way. I really appreciate that. Thank you. So good evening, uh, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem and Councilors. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. And could I, I just ask you real quick, yes. do you want questions before or during it or until after? the end? Okay. Yes, that would be best. I'm thank sorry I didn't ask that first. Nope. That was a good question. Yep. So as Sarah mentioned, my name is Shawnee Klein and I am a senior scientist and I'm also a communication strategist for Corona Environmental Consulting. And I just a little bit of background so you can understand why they hired us. I have over 23 years of experience working with water utilities, state and federal regulators, and also uh, researchers in the water sector. And I have spent a lot of time working with um, utilities to help them to secure their water resources 
and manage risks and also maintain a high water quality. So that is what my role is. And then of course, Dr. Chad Seidel, he is the president of our company. So I'm glad that he is here. He is a, a, a environmental engineer and he has over 20 years of experience in helping people to develop solutions to water quality and water treatment challenges. And then the person that is missing is our director of water resources, Margaret Kearns. And she has over 20 years of experience um, helping to assist to sustain sources of water that are clean. And I'm going to go ahead and introduce my colleague here, uh, Elizabeth Brown, before she gets started. Uh, Elizabeth has over 20 years of experience in invasive species and natural resource uh, uh, management. And in 2020, she went out and bravely founded her own company, Elizabeth Brown uh, Environmental. And her sole purpose is to assist uh, public and private land and water owners and managers with invasive species prevention and control activities. And a little bit of background that's super important is Elizabeth uh, served as the state invasive species program manager for Colorado Parks and Wildlife from 2008 to 2020. So now we will roll over to the lake. So Stanley Lake is recognized by many people along the Front Range um, next as... Next slide, please. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Next slide. Sorry. <laughs> please, next slide. Yes, now we can just go ahead. <laughs> yes, it is recognized as a, a great place to go out and enjoy the outdoors, and it's certainly beautiful out there. It's also an important wildlife <laughs> refuge, and there's even a camera out there on Bird Island, so anybody that's a bird aficionado <laughs> can check out to see what the birds are doing out there. But what many people may not appreciate is the fact that the water that is stored in Stanley Lake is the sole drinking water supply for the cities of Westminster and Northland, and it is the key drinking water supply for the city of Thornton. And so the total population that drinks water coming from Stanley Lake is approximately 350,000 people. So in the late 1980s, 90s, uh, as definitely population was starting to explode along the Front Range and in the Clear Creek watershed, the potential for unintended damage to the lake water quality was recognized by the three cities. And each of the cities had an interest in maintaining the highest quality of water possible for drinking water purposes. And the reason why it is so incredibly important to maintain the highest quality um, water is due to two key factors. First of all, source water protection is recognized as the first line of defense to protect um, public health and safety from potentially hazardous contaminants that could enter the water supply. And then the second very important aspect of maintaining high quality source water is the higher the quality of water, the less it costs to treat. And so thereby uh, it helps to keep water rates as affordable as possible for customers. So with these important shared reasons for maintaining water quality in the lake, Westminster entered into an agreement with the cities of Northland and Thornton uh, for the purpose of collaboratively working together to manage the lake and also monitor water quality. On November 28, 1994, the Stanley Lake Park Water Quality and Inter Water Quality Intergovernmental Agreement, which is also known as the IGA, uh, was signed and it had an initial term of 25 years. So in 2019, when that initial term came to um, an end, the, all of the cities agreed to sign an amendment just to give a little bit more time to negotiate some of the additional terms and revisions to the original agreement. After they did that on November 18th, 2020, a second amendment was agreed to, uh, which included several revisions to the original agreement. And one of those revisions uh, what included the funding of the security audit for Stanley Lake with the main purpose of identifying unmitigated threats to water quality and physical security of Stanley Lake. Uh, the information and recommendations from the security audit are intended to be used by the three cities for proactively planning. And yeah, we're way ahead. You can back up. <laughs> Two slides. Yeah, go back. <laughs> go back because uh, yeah, that keep it on that slide for right now. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. It seems like I'm talking a lot for just a slide. I, I feel your pain on that one. So um, the the whole purpose of this is so that so that the three cities really will be able to do better planning for mitigation for potential water quality threats and also physical threats to the city. Uh, Corona Environmental and um, Elizabeth Brown, myself and, and Elizabeth, we're going to be presenting on just the water quality and the aquatic nuisance species aspects of the project. 
And then an executive session, as Sarah said, uh, we'll be summarizing the work that Surveillance One did on the physical security. So the scope of the project included a review of the previous reports, plans and policies, including some data related to the lake. And we spent a lot of time gathering information directly from the technical staff at the three cities, as well as uh, staff from the companies that own and operate the canals. And of course, we made a number of visits to uh, the lake accompanied by Westminster City staff, and we also went into the upper watershed. And our investigation not only included aspects directly related to the lake, we also took a very high level look at the water treatment plants for each of the three cities so that it would help us to determine potential, the, the treatment potential in the event that there were to be dramatic changes in water quality to Stanley Lake. So one of the important factors that we had to take into consideration when assessing the lake um, and, and how it's managed is the complexity of ownership. And that's what this slide is all about. Um, it's the ownership of the water, the land, and the physical assets such as the dam, the outlet structures, and the pumps, the canals, and also any other conveyance structures. So this figure sort of helps to provide an idea of the complexity of the ownership of the lake, though it certainly doesn't fully portray all of the intricacies that are involved. So as you may know, water, water in Colorado is managed through water rights, and uh, the lake can hold approximately 42,743 acre feet of water. The three cities are share shareholders to the Stanley Lake Division of Frico, and as such uh, are owners of a pro rata uh, portion of the absolute and conditional water rights decreed to Stanley Lake. So when full, Westminster owns approximately 52.5% of the water that's in the lake, which is the, the equivalence of about 22,431 acre feet. Thornton owns approximately 28%. Northland owns approximately 16%. And Frico owns the remaining 3.5%. So the land immediately under the lake is owned by Frico. And then the parkland surrounding the lake is owned by the city of Westminster. The dam and the related water out, um, outlet infrastructure is owned and managed by Frico with oversight provided by the three cities through the Stanley Lake Operating Committee, which is also known as SLOC. And then Westminster is responsible for the management of the recreation on and around the lake. And adding yet another additional layer of complexity is how water is brought into the lake. So water is diverted from Clear Creek via three primary canals. The Church Ditch is owned and managed by the Church Ditch Water Authority. Farmers Highline Canal is owned and operated by the Farmers Highline and Reservoir Company. The Croak Canal is owned and operated by Frico. And a small portion of water uh, comes into Stanley Lake via Coal Creek, and that's via the Kinnear uh, Ditch Pipeline. And the Clear Creek Watershed is also very complex because there's numerous landowners, non-point source dischargers. There's also several point source or permitted dischargers, and there's a variety of other stakeholders. So through an, the thorough analysis of the information, and this is so important, it became really clear to us that the exceptional water quality in Stanley Lake is no accident. Uh, there has been intentional Con uh, continuous and collaborative efforts that have helped to ensure that the residents of each of the three cities have access to some of the best drinking water in Colorado's Front Range. And so some of the many examples of the efforts taken by the three cities in the past 28 years includes sustained collaborative funding, a comprehensive water quality monitoring program, collaboration with Upper Clear Creek watershed stakeholders, which also includes a uh, emergency management system, which has a call down list, uh, nutrient management efforts, which has included the support of a standard for chlorophyll A that was established in 2009 by the Colorado Water Quality Control Commission and uh, well-managed aquatic uh, nuisance species prevention program, which also includes a Eurasian milfoil biological pro control program. So yes, next slide. That was a lot to fit into those slides, wasn't it? I'm just an overachiever. Okay, so a fair majority of the key aspects of the water of the source water protection that the three cities have had control over have already been put in place. So the project team provided a comprehensive assessment of the potential threats which could impact water quality that have not yet already been addressed. 
And the report that we have distributed um, has, we, de we developed and, and provide some detailed explanation to the various unmitigated potential threats and mitigation suggestions that the three cities should consider going forward. Um, and while there are a number of mitigation and management considerations provided in the report, the following are what we believe to be the priority gaps and considerations. So uh, as the vast majority of the watershed is impacted by a wide variety of stakeholders, we recommend that there is a coordinated public outreach and communication program developed by the three cities with the goal of connecting with the surrounding community and also communities in Upper Clear Creek. And while there is already a call down list that is in place with the Upper Clear Creek stakeholders, we recommend a coordinated uh, we recommend coordinated emergency response drills, which would address a number of possible scenarios and in, would include emergency responders from the surrounding communities and upstream communities. Probably one of the greatest threats that the three cities have absolutely limited control over comes from the impacts from extreme events such as wildfires, floods, and droughts. And we are all very familiar with wildfires that can impact cities as it happened just recently with um, Louisville and Superior nearby. So one measure that has been used historically to protect lake water quality when there's been contamination events on Clear Creek is to shut down the diversions. And um, there are a number of factors that can delay the, uh, the shutdown to happen in, in a timely manner. Um, that, that, that includes water rights being one of the biggest issues. So therefore, uh, one consideration is to establish a formalized agreement for water diversions when there is a, an event in Clear Creek that has the potential to damage water quality. And as an example, that could potentially be you have a fire in the upper watershed, and then this, unfortunately happens all too often, there's floods that immediately happen afterwards, which would be very damaging to lake water quality. So a formal agreement would establish parameters around the, how the decisions are made to actually to shut down those diversions, and then also how you would manage impacts to water rights. Um, nutrient loading is also a ongoing concern, and that can cause harmful algal blooms and other deleterious water quality impacts. So one of the already identified contributors uh, of phosphorus comes directly from some yet to be identified source in Crow Canal. So working with FRICO to identify and mitigate the source of phosphorus is something that should probably be considered. And finally, while there has been a lot done to prevent aquatic nuisance species from entering the lake, the three cities should consider developing an early detection and response plan and upstream monitoring for aquatic nuisance species. And now I'm going to hand it over to Elizabeth for the rest of the presentation. Thank you. Next slide, please. <clears throat> All right, so I'm gonna take you back in time. Uh, the history of Stanley Lake actually dates back to the late 1800s. It was originally intended to provide water for irrigation and agriculture. And the dam was finished in 1911 and the final repairs in 1922. I said I was going back in time for you. Um, and the reason is that it's unclear when boating actually began on Stanley Lake, when the first boats actually launched on Stanley Lake. Um, in 1958, there was a study to examine uh, Stanley Lake as a regional park and we know boating was present then. We also know boating was present in 1970 when the city of Westminster first began uh, managing the recreation at the lake. It was then known as Lake Park. Uh, it was actually 15 years after that in 1985 when the city first began actively managing the boating recreation through the boat permit process. At that time, there were approximately 1,200 permits issued in 1985. However, a few years later in 1989, the number of available permits were cut in half due to concerns over water quality impacts from boating. You can see in very tiny print, I apologize, at the bottom of this uh, slide, there's a table there to give you a sample of the number of boat permits issued uh, and how they had been slightly reduced over time. As Shawnee previously described in 1994, the water owners, the cities of Westminster, Thornton, and North Glen with FRICO signed the IGA. This um, IGA set limits for recreation, including this decreasing amount of boat permits over time. They also restricted boating recreation by prohibiting the use of jet skis or personal watercraft 
and prohibiting any boats with onboard sanitation devices. It's also important to note, but it's not up on the slide, that in 1995, Eurasian water milfoil, which is an aquatic noxious weed, was detected in Stanley Lake. This invasive species did have impacts on the taste and odor of the drinking water, and its detection resulted really in the initial start of the Aquatic Nuisance Species Program, uh, which now includes the innovative biological control methods that Shawnee described. In 1998, of course, Stanley Lake was officially designated as a regional park. Ten years later, in 2008, Stanley Lake began their ANS, or Aquatic Nuisance Species, watercraft inspection and decontamination and quarantine program in conjunction with the state of Colorado and Western regional efforts to stop an introduction of zebra and quagga mussels. This cross-jurisdictional management effort followed the detection of the invasive quagga mussels at Lake Mead. This detection of quagga mussels at Lake Mead, one of our nation's largest recreational areas, confirmed the invasive mussels' ability to travel great distances over land on recreational trailer watercraft and result in a large infestation that impacts economies, water supply and distribution, wildlife habitat, and outdoor recreation. In 2016, the on-site paddlecraft rental program began at Stanley Lake. And a few years later in 2019, trailered powerboat use was suspended following the discovery that boat permit holders were circumventing the required watercraft inspection, decontamination, and quarantine procedures. Boat permits were refunded for that year. A collaborative advisory board called the Stanley Lake Boating Task Force was formed, and this board included members from the Friends of Stanley Lake, paddlers, boaters, the marine industry, and community members. The Citizens Task Force worked from April to November of 2019 to find a solution that would allow trailered powerboats back on the lake without compromising the quality of water. The task force explored boat tagging, tracking, water detection stickers, geofencing, GPS monitoring, one boat, one lake, decontaminating every boat, uh, modifications to the boat itself, raising fees, increasing penalties, and utilizing the state's data sharing system. Ultimately, the task force did not reach consensus and was unable to find a viable solution to restore trailered power boating without compromising water quality. The following year in 2020, the three cities renewed the IGA and further restricted boating recreation by allowing only non-trailered or hand-launched watercraft and small electric motors on the lake. Since that time, several partnerships have formed with groups that require a wakeless setting for recreation. In 2022, Stanley Lake became the first in-state to install an easy ADA-compliant kayak launch, in addition to the easy launches that allow paddlers to launch without water contact. It is important to note that just last month, the first adult zebra, uh, zebra mussel infestation was confirmed within the state of Colorado at Highline Lake State Park. Unfortunately, we now have a zebra mussel infestation in-state, which increases the risk to Stanley Lake. Next slide, please. Thank you. As part of the security assessment, we evaluated nine state listed prohibited invasive plants and eight animals that may pose a threat to Stanley Lake. We also examined the various pathways of introduction and vectors of spread for those ANS, including boating, fishing, um, organisms in trade or live industries, professional services, and natural vectors. When considering boating, it is important to note that not all boats pose the same threat or risk of introducing an aquatic nuisance species into the lake. For example, in the 1994 IGA, jet skis and onboard sanitation devices were prohibited. Jet skis would be considered a complex boat, and anything with an onboard sanitation device would be a very complex boat. In the 2020 IGA, the water owners also prohibited trailered motorized watercraft, disallowing the other types of complex and very complex boats. Complex and very complex boats have compartments such as bilges or ballast. They have water-cooled engines such as inboard, inboard, outboards, and outboard engines, and other systems and internal compartments that cannot be completely drained or visually inspected. This poses a high risk of transporting and introducing aquatic nuisance species. Research has shown that veligers, which is the initial life stage of a zebra or quagga mussel, 
can survive up to 27 days in standing water inside a boat. You can't see them. They are microscopic plankton in the water. The state of Colorado and their partners have intercepted more than 600 muscle impacted trailer watercraft since the ANS program began. That said, boating is still allowed at Stanley Lake today in the form of lower risk craft. Through the IGA, the water owners are permitting on water recreation by allowing low and medium risk boats. So that kind of orange line on that graphic to the left is what is allowed and to the right is what is not allowed at Stanley Lake. This includes hand launch, non-trailered watercraft, paddlecraft, and simple boats with small electric motors. These simpler boats are much easier to inspect and decontaminate, making them a lower risk for transporting ANS. The entire craft is visible and they generally do not hold water or have compartments that can harbor invasive species. They do not launch on trailers, which also can hide invasive plants, animals, and water, and can be quite difficult to inspect and decontaminate. Non-trailered watercraft are still required to complete an inspection and decontamination prior to launching in Stanley Lake. God bless you. And next slide, please. Thank you. So per the IGA, the current allowed on water recreation includes hand launched watercraft, paddle craft, and small electric motors. There are a number of items that are not allowed, including trailered power boats and other items that may pose a threat to water quality. Um, aquatic bait, belly boats, large electric motors, those water cooled engines such as diesel, <laughs> diesel. gas, diesel, or jet engines. Uh, launching of any kind of watercraft from a trailer, personal float tubes, scuba diving, swimming, wading, and single chambered flotation devices, or any floating device not designated for open water use. Next slide, please. There are benefits to boating for individual physical, mental, and emotional health, as well as for the social health of our families and communities. Boating offers an opportunity to get away from the busyness of our daily life and spend quality time with our friends and family. There are also economic benefits, as boating is the top contributor to the national outdoor recreation economy. In Colorado, recreational boating has a 1.3 billion annual economic impact, according to the National Marine Manufacturers Association, which includes impacts to local communities such as Westminster. There can also be negative consequences from boating, including impacts to the aquatic ecosystem, the introduction of invasive species, creating noise pollution, accelerating shoreline erosion, user conflicts and safety issues, decreasing water clarity, and altering water quality. Complex trailer power boats that are capable of creating large wakes may result in more disturbance than smaller, non-trailered, human-powered craft. Fuel-powered motors and engines can contribute unwanted contaminants into a water body. Trailers are also capable of transporting and introducing aquatic nuisance species into new waters. In 2010, the City of Westminster commissioned a study by HDR to determine viable treatment options and costs to maintain water quality, treatment plants, and distribution systems in the event that an introduction of zebra or quagga mussels were to happen at Stanley Lake. The study was updated in 2018 and identifies an initial capital cost of $3.2 to $11.1 million for capital improvements necessary um, for necessary equipment to manage the zebra and quagga mussel infestation. Additionally, HDR study notes that there could be up to $3.4 million in additional annual operating and maintenance costs. And the costs in the study have been adjusted to $2022. Next slide, please. <laughs> Lakes and reservoirs across the landscape are managed differently depending on the ownership, the intended purpose, and the needs of the end users. Recreation areas tend to prioritize recreational activities over other uses. Drinking water facilities tend to prioritize water quality over recreational activities. Stanley Lake Regional Park and Wildlife Refuge strives to maintain the highest quality and affordable drinking water for residents and businesses while also providing a diverse set of recreational opportunities for the region and maintaining the wildlife refuge. There are hundreds of boatable waters in Colorado. This table on the slide describes a few nearby reservoirs to demonstrate similarities and differences in management approaches. 
The first one on the list is Evergreen Lake. Evergreen Lake is a 600 acre reservoir that is the sole water supply for the town of Evergreen as managed by the Evergreen Metropolitan District. Non-trailered simple boats less than 15 feet are allowed May through September. They also have rentals available on site similar to Stanley Lake and boats must pass an ANS watercraft inspection prior to launching. They also allow electric motors. Arvada Reservoir is a 180 acre storage reservoir that is open April through October. It is a secondary drinking water supply for the city of Arvada. They allow simple watercraft with electric trolling motors only. All watercraft accessing the lake must pass an ANS inspection and decontamination prior to entry. It's worthy to note that the city of Arvada's main source of water is Ralston Reservoir, which is a 160 acre reservoir in Jefferson County. The dam is owned and managed by Denver Water and has, has historically been the sole source of water for Arvada's Ralston treatment plant. This reservoir is not open to recreation. Aurora Reservoir is an 800 acre storage reservoir that was completed in 1989 and added 31,000 acre feet of water storage and was designated a recreation area for the community. The city of Aurora has a complex water system that includes 12 reservoirs. Aurora Reservoir is open year round, but access to on water boating recreation is limited to April through November. Non motorized watercraft and electric motors are allowed in Aurora Reservoir. Motors that use fuel of any type must be removed, fully removed from the boat prior to launching. And of course, they require an ANS inspection prior to launching. Chatfield. Chatfield is a little bit different. Chatfield is a 4,822 acre reservoir on the South Platte River in Jefferson County. It actually straddles Jefferson and Douglas. Um, it was built specifically for flood control by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in response to a devastating flood back in 1965. Today, the water within Chatfield Reservoir is owned by Denver Water, and it is used primarily for storage but also for trade, exchange, agriculture, and drinking water, in addition to flood control. Chatfield um, is a managed by Colorado Parks and Wildlife and offers year-round recreation through a lease agreement with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Chatfield State Park is designated as a state recreation area and serves over 1.6 million visitors per year. Through an agreement with the state, Denver Water must maintain water levels for the community, recreation, but can fill or draw to maintain delivery to their constituents. Chaffield State Park offers a very diverse set of recreational opportunities, including all types of boating. They have a full service marina on site with 320 rented slips, a store, restaurant, dry storage, boat rentals, courtesy docks, pump outs, and even a fueling station. Gross Reservoir is a, now we're going to a smaller one, uh, only 440 acre reservoir owned and managed by Denver Water as part of their North Collection system. They only allow non-motorized car top paddle boats on the reservoir. Trailered motorized watercraft is prohibited along with belly boats, sailboats, even electric trolling motors and single chambered flotation devices. Finally, Thornton Reservoirs. Um, the Thornton Reservoirs are the alternate sources of water for the city of Thornton besides Stanley Lake. They do not permit boating or any recreation on their reservoirs. And with that, I will turn it over to Sarah. Thank you. So that this concludes the kind of informational portion of this. I think now we get into more of what the policy question is. Um, through this project, we have looked at a number of other um, newer technologies that have become available. The picture you see here on the right is a dip tank um, that where you actually take some of these complex boats and you put them in this hot water bath and run some of the more complex systems through the hot water, which kills theoretically the zebra, any zebra and quig mussels or other ANS that may be there. Um, there is one of these. Uh, it is patent pending, and it had. We have heard that it has been having mixed results, but it's still fairly new in its in its use. So this is one new and different piece of technology that was identified uh, through this process. Um, with that said, I think most of the other uh, new technologies fall within the realm 
of similar technologies that were evaluated during the voting task force. Um, and I, it gets down to this point of there is no solution that is going to be 100% all of the time. And when we were looking at these technologies with the voting task force, there was a very low risk tolerance for um, any potential to um, have zebra, quagga mussels, or any other ANS enter this enter our lake. Um, that is a policy decision that is within council's control um, to make that decision that we would um, change our risk tolerance to um, allow for some of these risks. Uh, moving into this slide specifically, however, um, the IGA between Thornton and North Glen and Westminster was completed, as you know, in 2020. And that IGA specifically prohibits us from putting trailered boats these complex boats on Stanley Lake. Uh, we do have letters from both the city of Thornton and Northland. We didn't want to speak for them, so we asked that they put their stance in writing. And if you don't mind, I may read just a couple of excerpts um, from their uh, city mayors. Um, so this was all attached uh, to the packet, uh, so you can read their entire statements. Uh, from the city of Thornton's Jan Coleman, uh, their mayor, um, she says, the ban on trailered motorized boats established by the Stanley Lake Park IGA is the best and most protective measure to realize the shared water quality protection goal of the IGA cities. Considerable effort and time went into amending the IGA to prevent boating. And Thornton does not wish to allocate resources to this topic again during the remaining eight years of the IGA term. So this IGA will be up in 2030 for renegotiation, and that's the eight years that she's speaking of. Uh, from the city of North Glen, um, their mayor, Meredith Lady, uh, says North Glen specifically and adamantly supports the continued prohibition of trailer boats on Stanley Lake as a means of protecting our water supply from harmful invasive species. So with that said, um, because of their ownership of water rights within Stanley, um, there is not anything further that staff is going to be able to do in order to um, get boats back on the lake at this juncture. However, we, we can continue to keep on top of research, look, continue to look at things like this dip tank so that when the IGA expires that we're prepared to have that conversation. Um, certainly willing to take thoughts from council if there is another action that you would like for us to take if you'd like to continue the conversation with Thornton and Northland we are happy to do so. Mayor Pro Tem. Um, I would like to the opportunity to talk to those councils because I've spoke to some of those council members and they don't know about that letter. So <clears throat> I'm, I'm a little frustrated by that to be brief mm -hmm. because these IGAs are agreements between bodies of councils, not mayors. Those mayors don't have a right to speak for their council. Um, and I'd be happy to make phone calls to each of them and tell them so. Um, if their councils agree with that, great. Um, I can tell you as somebody who was here through this process, I had frustrations through the process um, and a tad bit disagree with what was stated in this report as far as what came out of the task force. Um, I listened to a lot of those meetings as well as I know some of my colleagues did who were um, paying attention at the time. Don't specifically re recollect if they were on council the whole time, but at least part of the time. And I know three of us who are still here during the IGA voted against it. Um, not because we don't think water quality and all the risks are important, but because it seemed um, to me anyway, and I'll let my colleagues speak for themselves, um, uneven handed we and i mean you demonstrated throughout this report the fact that um, some of this other recommended continued recreational um, uses still has risk so we're deciding what risk and i mean you even um, noted things coming downstream and frankly there's very little control we have over that so i'm not saying that means that we cast aside and take risk but there was um, some reasonable in my mind compared to what we had been doing for, you know, since the beginning of this program um, in improvements to security that were suggested that really didn't finish getting chased down. And I know that that, that voting community were very loud about it. Um, 
it did actually end in some of those folks leaving the community. Um, so I don't know, you know, how much appetite there is for that still. But I guess my bottom line is I'd like to actually talk with the, some of those um, council bodies to make sure that they're all in the know and that it wasn't um, particular members of their staff or council making decisions. And I don't know that, but I do know pulling some of them, they didn't, didn't know. They hadn't spoken about it recently since the IGA. And that concerns me. Um, I did have a couple of questions that I wanted to, to ask. As far as one of the big things that came up as a reason from the voting community, and it's not necessarily um, the only thing that you should judge, but you talked about mm -hmm. revenue. And through that, they talked a lot about revenue loss. Do we have any idea now that we're a couple of years into not allowing votes, what that looks like? Understanding that that's probably a complex thing considering we just went through the, the whole pandemic, but I have to imagine that we have some idea around that because growing up in the area, my entire life, I do know that the voting community, you know, did a lot of business with our restaurants and gas uh, facilities in that area. So maybe I can address your your first concern. Um, we can go back and figure out a good way of um, how staff could support you if you are interested in approaching the Thornton and Northland City Councils. Um, so we can come come back to them. And to, to you all and uh, come up with a way of, of how we might approach that so that we can make sure that um, both city councils are fully represented here. Um, so we're happy to do that to move forward. Um, our friends in Parks, Rec, and Library actually knew that uh, some of these cost questions were coming. Um, so we have one question here that was uh, we answered when uh, actually Councilor Numella asked this question last week. Um, is there additional opportunity for re revenue through non-trailer voting? And we also have some information on the lost revenue from uh, the uh, trailer voting permits. So trailer voting permits provided a revenue of $488,796 in 2018. Um, if we were to bring trailer boats back on in the future, uh, we would have to decide how many permits we were going to issue and what at what cost we would charge for that. And that would probably be related to whichever um, protective uh, strategy we were using and the cost of that. So that cost would likely get um, put onto the boating permits. But so it was a little less than half a million dollars of lost rev revenue um, based on the 2018 dollars. That was just on permits? That was on trailered boating permits. So one of the things in the task force that the boaters were clear about was that they would be even, I mean, this is just a thing that they were willing to pay more if it meant going towards the cause. Um, but with that being said, so one of the, the points that were brought up in the um, presentation was about water quality and the cost of, of treating the water. Has that cost changed any without boats? Is there an actual tangible number that says this actually decrease the cost that it is to, to deliver quality drinking water and have we seen a quality change? So um, the first side of that is no, we have not seen substantial changes in what it costs to treat our water. Our water quality is generally the same, at least in terms that we would see from uh, cost of chemical and cost of power for water treatment. So we have not seen a change there. We have seen the clarity of the lake increasing over the last few years. Um, it's hard to tell how much of that is from boating and how much of that is from other, other sources. Fair enough. Um, I guess the, you know, my bottom thing for the bottom line for the, the group that I want us to think about, and I do want our, our neighboring cities who ultimately are the stewards of their water supply is to understand the full risks. Um, because to me, we are measuring, you know, one against the other. And, and I don't know that if it's that big of a deal with the motorized boats, if the other ones to me are uh, any less of a risk. Understanding that my take on it has been that we've been less concerned about them. And to me, that's where you end up getting sucker punched, quite frankly. And so I'm, I'm, I'm kind of more concerned about those areas because this was a pretty scrutinized program. The fact that people got around it and then we decided to totally upend it, I think is to me what has always been kind of knee jerk. We should have addressed the folks that broke the system, figured out how they did it and fixed the system 
Um, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't always say, is this even a use that we should use? Um, my other comments and questions and concerns probably are more appropriate for the next part um, because they're more security related. Um, because I, I certainly um, have concerns just in general because it's the drinking water that's outside of boating and you know, so it's probably more appropriate for that. But I appreciate the presentation and all the work that's went into it. I know this has been a topic of discussion pretty much the entire time I've been here and obviously for decades before. So, And we'll continue to work forward, uh, work through how we can best assist you in addressing the other councils. Councilor Seymour. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, Ms. Brown, if I, I could ask you some questions, if you can help me with this too, is that you mentioned um, or part of the presentation that um, zebra or quagga mussels can only live 27-ish days outside of water, even in a tank? Yeah, so thank you, good question. Um, yeah, so there's research um, up to 27 days in water in a compartment within a boat. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, so that would be in a ballast or something. Yeah, ballast. Or, or inside a, a trailer that's maybe been capped, but yet, Stanley Lake had a 39 day quarantine, which had been increased over time too. So that's a comment, that's not a question. So that I think that that affected the boating community too. And then do, do we know if, if the Highline Lake is one of the uh, CPW's monitored lakes where they do, okay. So this would, be, this would be the first monitored boating lake in Colorado or Wyoming to ever, ever have an adult zebra mussel, correct? correct? Okay, and this is, they found one? No, unfortunately, um, I don't know the exact number of adults that they found, but in September, that was the original detection, and then they found more in October. And I know that CPW has been out monitoring, uh, doing extensive monitoring of the lake and the canals that feed it uh, to try to determine if they're, if they're upstream, and we don't know that yet, but they now have had two detections um, on both sides of Okay. And then um, do we know, you know, for a fact at a certain temperature that we can kill everything that it touches, what, 140 degrees, whatever it may be. And, and the dip tank, and I would recommend to my colleagues that you go to YouTube and watch this because it's been on there for three years and it got me excited too, is that a boater backs their entire trailer and boat in the heat source is kicked up to the correct temperature. They turn on the boats and the ballast and the whole thing. Trailer, everything is cleaned. And at a much faster and more effective rate than spraying. But there's been issues with that or they haven't been able to get their patent or? Um, yeah, so the patent is still pending. And um, they installed it in May of 2021 at Wawi uh, boat ramp at Lake Powell. Um, and uh, so their first full year was 2022. Uh, and I do have a call into the company to try to get more information about the dip tank, um, but we haven't seen any exact results yet. I know that 2022, they were having some algae problems with the tank, but um, so it, yeah, that's that's about all I know so far. Okay, so that, that would fix that problem because it's one of those things too. And I agree with Mayor Pro Tem as far as um, the amount of knowledge that our fellow counselors in Northland and Thornton have not been part of this process because I was one of those people that was almost at every single boating meeting and tagging meeting and then saw what, what the final results of that was. And that was extremely disappointing because the process I thought was usurped. But at, at Chatfield, have there been any villager, villagers at Chatfield, even with it's one of the most used lakes in the front range? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and they, they follow the, well, obviously CPW runs that. So they follow their program to the T. And so, um, we can only assume then at Highline that there was a lapse in the procedure. We don't know. They were performing inspections and decontaminations according to the state protocol. Okay. So one way, one way to do that then would be, since we no longer have storage at Stanley Lake and there's some issues with that too, is that if, if we would get to the point of every boat being decontaminated, whether we tag it or not tag it, we don't care, you come into our lake, we would we would have as protective of, of a level as possible, correct? Or greater than any other lake in Colorado? Greater than other lakes, absolutely. Okay. 
There's a comment then, from the back from Holly. I just had a question about decontaminate every uh, boat as they come in, because each boat takes about an hour. Mm -hmm. So we could put about 10 boats a day on if we decontaminated every boat as they came in. The dip tank takes seven minutes. Oh, the dip tank, of course. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm not talking about current technology. Oh, okay. Yeah. Absolutely. We'd have, yeah, and, and the boaters would have to pay for the dip tank or two dip tanks, whatever it takes. Okay. So th there is a way to get to a high level of confidence with the correct equipment and decontaminating every boat. Okay. I'll take that as a yes. A maybe. A higher level of confidence. Yeah, I can't I can't speak to the efficacy of the dip tank because I haven't seen any data on it. I just let's say if we can <laughs> if we can get all the ballast, all everything to get hit with 140 degree water, which kills everything. Whatever it is, dip tank, great flood, I don't care. <laughs> then we would we would have a process in place where we would have a very high level of confidence of killing everything that was on there. But regardless. Zebras, quaggas, any other AFs. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I was, that was the question I was going to ask you. I'm going to trust in you as the expert. What you've seen the dip tank in action? I have not been to Lake Powell, unfortunately, okay. to see it, but hope to one day. <laughs> I've seen the videos. Assuming <laughs> that technology or some version of it does get approved, patented, and released. Is that a step? I would be more comfortable if someone like you or some expert says, yes, I've seen it. I certify that this will take care of the issue. Do you recommend that as a sort of step that we actually don't assume where we just say, tell us the truth? What what will what will this handle our situation? Um, again, I'm kind of anxious to get some data on it from the state of state of Utah. Um, it's impressive technology. You back the whole boat in, you run every system. Um, and and so in theory, if if the boaters are doing that, it's being monitored. It is a step above what we have right now with our on-demand systems, which is actually a step above what we had five years ago with our power washers. So it is an advancement. So the question is, do you recommend that we actually seek seek a recommendation from you? or peer or 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 an, or an expert before we make that assumption um, in the future. Absolutely. I I would recommend getting getting data from Utah and and Clean Lakes who makes it and uh, examining that before making that assumption. And my second question was we sorry. If I might add to that. This is certainly could be an option in the future and there would be a pretty good amount of engineering and that we'd have to figure out. It's a lot of water. You have to figure out what you do with the dirty water, where you put it, it's potentially contaminated. So you've got to get rid of it. So there's a lot of, there'd be a lot of work to get us there to that point. So we would absolutely have experts on board to help us do that. And that links to my second question, which is how far off do you think we are from real technology that can help us here? If that's not even close. I think it's going to be a matter of getting data on this. I, we would definitely want to see. That's a hard question. Um, not knowing what they're going to see and what they have seen this year. The invasive species, invasive. they found one, now they found a lot more, or three, you said, not a lot more. but At Highline? Yeah. Yes. Do they spread? How quickly do they reproduce these species? They're incredibly prolific. Um, a single female can can release up to a million eggs in the spawning season. So they are incredibly prolific. And, and so it's more of an exponential. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, thanks. Mr. Baker. Yeah. A uh, couple questions. In like 2014, didn't the Parks and Rec do a whole? use of a really Stanley Lake study and wasn't power boating part of that? The master plan? Yeah. The master plan never was brought forth. So we paid $175,000 for something we never used. Uh, 
Sorry, I know that the, we did complete a master plan, but it was not brought to council because the year that it was completed, um, part of that master plan included boating. And at that point, we had taken boating off the lake, so the master plan was no longer applicable. So we don't have a master plan in place at this time. Gotcha. So when do we take boating off the lake? 2019. But wasn't this done in 2014? It was done in 2014 and then it was done, uh, we actually revisited it in 2017. Um, I, I'm not sure exactly why it wasn't brought forth at that time. Um, I just know it, at that point it hadn't been brought to council. Okay. Uh, the next question I have is uh, if there was a 39 day waiting period before you could use the boat on the lake, wouldn't that take care of all the muscle? It was 30, uh, 30 days. So 27 days was what the study stated. So we had a 30 day quarantine on all lakes and at, or on all quarantines. And absolutely that would have done the trick um, had everyone followed the quarantine accordingly. Okay. How many people violated it? 24 that we know of. And how were they how how were they able to violate it? Uh, they were able to manipulate the tag and wire system, and to the point that we could not notice that they had taken it off their boat and reattached it. And so we were shown how that was done. And once that was pointed out to us, we sent a copy of our CLs, which is the Colorado registration uh, licenses, to the state just to compare. Um, if they had launched on any other water, and that's when the state notified us that they had launched on other waters outside of the state. Okay. So we could do something like we could lock the boat and trailer, and that would prevent that, right? Lock it uh, in Really lock it to a post in the ground. <laughs> uh, sure. If we locked a boat to the post in the ground and kept our eye on it, we could certainly make sure that it wouldn't launch at the lake without, yeah, sure, yes. Okay. And so how much were permits on the lake? 900. $900, and that's the way, and that's the way we got five, 600 boats to pay half a million dollars. Correct. Okay, and that was for the season? That was. And the rules were they couldn't take it off the lake unless they went back through the quarantine? Correct. Okay. Uh, and, uh, just some background questions as I was looking at things. Uh, so the church farmers and croak take water out of Clear Creek at different interception points. Correct. Okay. And they take that out because of the history of when those irrigation companies were formed? Um, I probably shouldn't speak to that. So it was, um, it's related to the water decrees that are associated with those ditches. So the court dictates when we can and can't divert water through each of the different ditches. Gotcha. So it's like the time of year we can take them? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Because of course the church is the highest up. So it gives the best quality of water. They're pretty close together. Um, so there's probably not a ton of difference, but that's probably pretty accurate. And so why does the croak has to have the phosphorus problem? We don't know. Uh, that is a gap that we have. We know that we do see higher phosphorus coming out of the croak. Um, more, the, more phosphorus than that is going into the croak, we see coming out of the croak. And we have not identified the source yet. There's one of the things with the croak. Okay, sir, can you have to come to the table? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Sorry, one of the things with the croak canal is that uh, the banks are not extremely stable. And so anytime you have erosion, that can be a, a contributor. There was a study that was done that obviously helped to indicate that there is phosphorus that's actually picked up. And there's a certain segment where it is very clearly spiking. So realistically, a little bit of additional work could probably help to figure out where that's coming from. Uh, the other thing is, is there's certainly mitigation that can be done to those canals, but that would require working very closely with FRICO since the city doesn't either own or operate those canals. Well, if we own 50% of the lake, don't we own 50% of FRICO too? No, sir. No. Okay, so they must have a bunch of other product elsewhere? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, 
we're very fortunate because we don't have any agriculture upstream, right? And we've got they're, they're, like half a dozen cities upstream. Yeah, so there, what you definitely do have upstream, you are very fortunate. First of all, let me just say, yes, you're very fortunate. That's, you, you do have some pretty good water coming down Clear Creek, but there are non-point source discharges. And so that would be any type of stormwater that's coming off of municipalities upstream. That could also account for things like septic tanks that are upstream that could eventually end up seeping into the water. So you do have things aside from your permitted discharges, but yeah, I would say you are very fortunate still. And as I read the thing, there are no limits on how much nutrients the upstream cities can really discharge on us, are there? That, so this was one of the things that was very fortunate that uh, has happened is you do have a chlorophyll A standard. And that was highly supported by previous staff that worked at the city. That chlorophyll A standard actually did end up creating a situation wherein those upstream dischargers did have to start um, having regulations in their uh, permitted and their permits for uh, nutrients. So yes, that that was the big driver for that chlorophyll A standard was to protect the lake from upstream dischargers. Okay, but I mean, aren't there all kinds of other nutrients and like? in like basically municipal wastewater? So that's exactly, those are your permitted dischargers are your um, municipal wastewater plants. So yes, they have permit regulations that help, that require them to stay within certain parameters for nutrients. And they've done a fabulous job. They're continuing to do additional work as well, but we've seen incredible improvements in the discharge upstream. Okay. Upper Clear Creek. Yes, and, why? and Upper Clear Creek Agreement too. Yes, thank mm -hmm. you. And why is uh, swimming not allowed? So there's a couple of reasons. One, swimming, um, particularly along the bank, can kick up sediment, which can increase turbidity. And um, there is also plutonium in the lake, in the bottom of the lake. And that's, you can find more information on that on our website. It's buried very deep, but we want to do our absolute best to keep sediment in the lake from being disturbed for that reason. Okay, and how uh, and so, and so because we don't have a formalized beach where we brought in sand and made a place for swimming, that's the big concern. Yes, that and you end up you can end up with things like babies with diapers and E. coli and things that you can introduce to the lake. That's oh, not swimmers. Ideal. Yes. Yes. Anyone who has a pool those. <laughs> yes. Look okay. at how many times Chatfields shut down for E. coli. Coli comes from every creature. Uh, <laughs> how much did the power boats add to like gasoline and, and uh, those kind of? E-tex and that kind of thing. Do we ever see it? Because, because every boat leaks a little bit. <laughs> We're going to just bring the whole audience down here. <laughs> Apologies. Um, back when, there, when we had trailer boating, on, on standard, we ran a test called BTEX, and that measures for fuels and hydrocarbons and things like that. And it was only very rarely we would get a hit on that BTEX uh, analysis. Um, that those particular chemicals are very volatile, and if you don't catch them at the right time, they'll they will dissipate. Um, so we we've looked, we've seen it but never to the level that we were that concerned about. So our biggest concerns with power boating is because of the energy they produce in their lakes, they can kick up the shoreline and make the wadi much more cloudy. Okay. And ANS concerns. And, and yeah. aquatic plants, they also um, disturb the aquatic plants. So with the milfoil that we have in the reservoir, the, the props will actually cut that up and then that milfoil will spread uh, out, out of fragmentation. So that's another concern that we have. Yeah, did I read it properly that that was brought in to really stabilize banks? No, sir. Oh, okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Uh, and of course, the only way to change the eight year remaining agreement is to get the other two cities to, to agree. Yes, sir. Thank you. Oh, and, and one other question. 
Don't we get like 1,700 acre feet a year out of the Moffat Tunnel and put it in Stanley? We have a take or pay of 1,750 up to 4,500 acre feet that we can take through that system. And we put that in Stanley, right? Yes, that's, that is the Coal Creek water that Shawnee was speaking about at the beginning of the presentation. Gotcha. Thank you. Councilor Emmons. Um, all right. So being uh, a counselor on our campaigning and then on during uh, this whole process, um, the, the beginning of ending voting on Stanley Lake um, was very unfortunate. Um, miscommunication was one of the biggest things uh, because we said we're closing and then we said, oh, wait, wait, wait. Was, there was such an outcry that we said, okay, we'll work with you. We'll bring a task force together and find solutions. When the whole, the whole time, the end goal was to bring power boats off Stanley Lake. There was never a solution oriented task force. When I find it disingenuous and very insulting to not only community members and people who put time and effort and passion into this to say that the task force didn't come up with a consensus of any solutions. They brought several solutions. And to say that that there was not a solution or consensus is that the staff never provided a direction on, on getting to a solution. So that's very, that's very disheartening to hear for one. Um, and excuse, excuse me, because I'm a little passionate on this too, um, because <laughs> if we're if we're changing policy, if we're changing um, something that has been instituted um, for decades, um, there's a process to it. And there are communication channels and um, a, a real genuine um, outreach that can happen and that didn't happen in this case. Hence the um, ask on security on Stanley Lake because we said, okay, if, um, if we're bringing off uh, boaters who, mind you, um, most were law abiding in, um, in being on this lake, were there as support for security. They were there constantly on the lake, being able to have eyes and ears around it. So taking that off then removes that assurance or a, a level of security. And so um, in that, um, one of, I, if it's in here, I missed it and I apologize. Very thorough report. Um, by the way, but um, in that, did, th did this report vet any of the security ideas that came forward from the task force? Because that was one of the biggest items from the council is, okay, if if we're doing GPS, is that going to be, a, what level is the security risk? If we're going to do locks on boats, what level is that security risk? If we're going to do X, Y, Z, all three or five or 10 together, does that provide higher assurance than not? And so we never had those answers. And so then we went round and round in circles as far as what's the security? How are we going to make this work? And so um, I'm seeing your answers and your nodding heads of the, that solutions from the task force were not vetted in the security option. No, they were not. Okay. Um, so that was a little disappointing. I would have wanted to understand um, it, and it made perfect sense in timing to understand whether or not if taking five of those would have been a good option. And if not, why? Um, for, I just want to understand this too, that in 2016, um, we were able to provide paddle, board, paddle boat permits. Um, was there a wake area for that? Was there? A wake area for no power. wake area. Yes. yes. Thank you. Yes. And yeah. So in that area, we're in, sorry. <laughs> sorry, please clear up here. Yeah, yeah. No, that's the plan. <laughs> yes. We have approximately 200 surface acres that we don't even allow the electric motors on. That actually comes from an agreement with Fish and Wildlife to protect the Eagle area and Bird Island with the <coughs> uh, heronry there. So that remains and has always been. Okay. So even when there were power power boats, there was a no wake area. Yeah, there were 200 surface acres designated as no wake. Okay, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, in your report, um, there was also, I feel like it was missed. Um, I would have liked to understand um, how Cherry Creek and Boulder 
run their programs because they're also boating and I believe Boulder maybe a sole source um, drinking water for um, their community. So I would like to have better understood those as how they fit into just wondering how you pick um, certain links to highlight. Yeah, I'm, unfortunately I did not research those for part of this report. Um, so we picked reservoirs that were uh, nearby that, that folks often ask questions about and compared to Stanley Lake. So, um, you know, we could consider doing a broader, uh, if you have other reservoirs you have questions on, additional research on those um, we could provide, but I didn't look at those okay. two specific. Yeah, because those two came up in the, the task force and that was quite often. Boulder Cherry and Cherry Creek. Creek. Cherry Creek, yeah. I can speak a little more, well, we'll get more information back to you so that you can understand those two specifically. Okay, perfect, thank you. Um, I will say that I don't want the narrative to become that um, we're the council, or at least, at least specifically for myself, that um, water quality is not a priority. Um, I mean, water quality has been number one issue for council for the time, at least the time that I've been on for th the last three years. Um, but I, I truly, in, in being in the weeds <laughs> with this um, for four plus years, I think that there is good opportunity to find good solutions for everyone involved. Um, I think we've heard, I've, I've heard um, analysis from my colleagues as far as um, what they've researched and what we've heard over the years. Um, I think that there's a, a, a good opportunity for um, us to look at putting power boats back on. Mm -hmm. um, and I believe that there, not just a one boat, not just a one uh, boat lake situation, um, where we have one security front line. I'm I, I'm seeing three or four options that could help reinforce it. But let's be honest, life is not 100% assurance at all in anything. Um, and so I, my policy stance um, that I'd like to pose to my colleagues, I'm interested in amending the IGA and going back to. Thornton and, and uh, Northwood. Sorry, Mayor, is that maybe a question that we could ask of council? I think I'm understanding that four councilors are interested, but that would be good for us. I was just writing it on my list is to sum up okay, and see you. where we're at. Um, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, two, two things. I think one of the things when, and I want to make sure that this is clarified, a few things. One, water quality is always going to be the most important in water safety, and that's why I think it needs to be more holistic if we're really that afraid of, of power boats. Um, but one of the things that I was frustrated with throughout the IGA process, and the reason I would like to make sure that the other council sees the same things that we do, is what were they judging that off of? Because a lot of what they heard out of here from, from the city was, this is a bad idea. You can't do it. You're going to risk your drinking water. That was consistently the narrative that was pushed. And so what I always wanted to get out of them, and I think I heard the same sentiment from the folks who voted against that IGA was, is there a threshold that those other cities would find acceptable? Because if there's not, there's not. And if they don't want to go forward with it, you know, that's a, a different story because it is a shared risk. But what I was never comfortable with is that those full bodies, um, we're saying there's no acceptable risk, understanding that everything in life has a risk. Um, because I'd like to understand that from them holistically on, on all the different things that, that we're talking about as far as risks and what, you know, what's their, their gauge. And I think that that's fair to those communities that they have that same, um, call it bite at the apple. Um, so I, I hope that if we do decide that, that that's the, uh, the way that we bring it forward to them, that they're getting to have the same conversation and that all the different members of the IGA are comfortable that you know we're all working off the same uh, playing field. The other thing I just wanted to ask, and this could be for another time, just because I was a community member on the master plan. So I am curious like if there was anything that was a takeaway from that, and some of that is certainly outside of the scope of this conversation, but there were a lot of recreational components of it. There, I mean, trail, a ton of different things, parks and rec, as far as what was going to be done with that. And there was a lot of time and effort put into that. So I'm just curious if that's something that at some point we dust off and try to see what we can uh, get get out of it since people put time into it. Mm -hmm. 
And this is the one from 2014 and 17? Yep. Any other questions? Um, well, I go back to 2008 making the original um, how we were going to manage the muscles or not. And we were the ones that set the precedents that everybody else has started to follow. And then when I got off council and all of this started erupting, I did try to pay some attention. Um, I wasn't involved to the extent those that were on council then, but even the point where if they were, the boaters were willing to keep their boats Stanley use only. I mean, I never heard that um, discussion. Don't know. I mean, door knocking, I certainly heard it this last time running again, but um, so I don't, I, I too don't feel like the things that these people were asked for nine months to go through were ever really vetted. And I don't look at you folks because it was different faces here that, that did that. And so I have that there. Um, and I know it was different faces that ran that whole thing, but I still have to say it wasn't fair to the boating community. I don't care where I've been, what position I have been, you never ask a task force to spend nine months of their life when you have an answer already made up. And that's from an outsider looking in at that time as a citizen, that is how it looked. And, um, and we did lose people from this city because of it. Um, and, and to me, that's very sad. So um, I, I do too know that um, the letters that we got did not go to the full body of the council. Um, I know if I had written a letter like that without you six not knowing about it, um, I wouldn't show up to a meeting the next night. But anyway, um, so I just think having dinner together with them, having some of those conversations can't hurt. We need to share where we're at, hear how they came to their decisions and see where it lays. But I am not against boating. Um, I think we can have several things on that lake. We have had in the past. It is um, water quality. The 20 some years I've been involved has been nothing but number one. So um, I don't understand all of the politics or whatever was involved in it, but I think it's time to have some hard conversations and just figure it all out. I, and I, I, apolo I apologize to the, to the task force for how it all went down. Um, we appreciate the time and energy. I heard some good things come out of there. I don't know why they weren't looked at after you all gave that input, but um, it's unfortunate. So I have heard several requests for getting together and talking with those other councils. Is, do I hear consensus on that? Mm -hmm. So somehow we need to make that happen. Can I summarize, Mayor, would you mind? I think I got a couple good points that kind of picked up on the consensus. So um, first of all, the 2014-17 Stanley Lake Master Plan, I think we just need to dig that thing out, find it and share it with the council and the staff because you know that's, that's a while ago. So I think that's an easy win and something we can do so that people at least have some information. Um, so that's can that's that be an info item on the um, uh, packet so that the public can read that as well. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, good idea. Um, so I think that's kind of first step. Uh, second step is is uh, since the question was raised about, uh, I guess it's the Boulder and Cherry Creek Reservoir comparison. It's uh, you know certainly uh, something that was looked at previously, and so. If we could just look at those two sources um, and do the same level, kind of add them into the spreadsheet, uh, I think that might be helpful. Um, so that takes care of that. I think the next step is to, uh, to the Mayor Pro Tem's point, is to set up some kind of uh, opportunity to engage. And I'll talk to those city managers and we'll figure out um, how we can talk to North Glen and how we can talk to uh, Thornton about this topic. And so we can certainly do that. We used um, to do dinners often. 
Like a our, dinner? Yeah, yeah. we used okay. to break bread with all of our neighboring cities. Okay, so, you know, maybe that's the right forum, but I think that's kind of the third step. And then based upon those conversations, then to Councillor Emmons, if those conversations lead us down a path of an amendment to the IGA, we could certainly um, pursue that. But I think we got to get these other three things knocked out before we move down that path. Is that a fair assessment of the conversation this evening? There was one more on that. It's not just the dinner, it's to, it's to present the same factual information. Right. Yeah, I think this is going to be a, uh, um, a presentation as part of that dinner, if you will. We'll have to bring our consultants back and ask if, if you all would be able to join us. Um, I, I, I can tell you that the city of Northland has already requested that we go and present. Oh. So we are trying to get on the count on the calendar for a presentation to Northland City Council. Oh. I believe that Thornton was kind of waiting to see when they were going to do that. Okay. So, okay. Yes. so yeah, so we've got some opportunities for engagement. The, the other thing, and this is probably my favorite part of what you guys are talking about moving forward, um, whether it's boats or anything else that we come up with our, our partners in, um, be it in FICO or the people upstream that says, here's the cadence in which we're going to continue to have these conversations because this is, I'm assuming, going to be something that we want to do on some sort of set interval where we look at all the risks as as a partners and make sure that, you know, we're agreeing where we're at. Um, because even if we don't look at the IGA now, one of the things in the IGA when they did approve it was, that we were going to continue to have these conversations. So um, I would appreciate us putting some sort of uh, structure around what that actually looks like. Um, is it regular meetings for us to come to this council body or for the three cities to talk about this specific issue? I think that you have to involve all three because they all have risk at some point. How that looks, I mean, that doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, the dinners and stuff. I think it has to be something that each of those three bodies are fully comfortable with and that we understand each of us are agreeing. Here's the interval which we're going to review our risks together. And I don't think that it should be a 10-year IGA because how much can happen in a 10-year interval? That should be something that, that we care enough about our, our water risks that we want to do on a more uh, frequent interval, even if it's more of a high level. Um, review in my mind. Councilor Baker. And there were other identified risks like having a pre-planned agreement for the emergency situations where we have to close the gates and divert the water. And that sounds like that's unresolved and that would be a excellent time to do that. And should we advocate for like sedimentation dams on gulches in the upper basin and all this sort of stuff? Absolutely. There is a lot of work that we identified here in this report yes. that we need to do. What do you think? We're Does good. that kind We're of wrap go. things up? Yep. Okay, good. Thank you everybody for you. the presentations and information. Council need a break before you go into executive session? Yes, please. Okay. Let's get it done. Uh -huh. Line item. I forgot about it at dinner. If you're attending the Hmong New Year celebration, please be early. Yeah. Be, yeah. This is not something you want to walk into. This yeah. is we are honored guests and we are in the front row. So, yeah.